Well, welcome to another episode of Breakaway from the Rat Race. And today I have the pleasure of meeting with Mike Moroski. He's a 30 year uh, real estate investment veteran and the founder of My Core Intentions. Uh, Mike has an incredible life story, and you'll hear all about that. But he started as a, he's an entrepreneur, an author, a public speaker, and personal coach. And he has a deep desire to help others li live. Uh, an extraordinary life. I really like that when, uh, so he has control over like $285 million in real estate transactions. And again, as I said, like Mike has an incredible story. We're going to get into that. And he has coached hundreds of real estate investors to fulfill their dreams. Mike, welcome to the show. Eric, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I know this has been a while for us to get together. So I'm glad we finally yeah. <laughs> get this chance. Yeah, no. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So we had been kind of schedule and reschedule and reschedule. So yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have you uh, be able to uh, have our schedule coordinate. That's great. So, uh, so Mike, tell us a little bit about kind of like how you got started uh, in, uh, you know, general contractor business, and then kind of how you went into more like the real estate and as a sales agent later on, and uh, kind of how, you know, how you got started and how you got interested. Yeah, interesting. Uh that you ask how I got started in the general contractor business, because uh, um, I, I don't talk about that very often. So um, first of all, I don't come from a family that was entrepreneur at all. And, and I don't know how I got the bug, right? Uh, but I just, I always worked for people and I was like, God, I could do this. I could do better than this. You know, this customer service is terrible. And that's, you know, that was always my mentality. And so I was in the, uh, it's actually in the swimming pool business. I built in-ground swimming pools and serviced them. And, and you know, I know that you've come from the cold weather where you have three months of summer and the rest is winter. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make a living in that business in, in that yeah. kind of climate. So I would hire guys in the uh, springtime. I'd train them, spend a bunch of time and money on them, get them up to speed. They'd work all summer, come wintertime, We'd close swimming pools. I'd have to put them on unemployment, hope they'd come back in the springtime and they wouldn't, they'd go find another job and wouldn't come back. So now I was training guys again. So this rat race that I was in, I, I it got me to a point where I was like, I have to do something different. I have to keep these guys busy all year long. Mm -hmm. So I started doing kitchen and bath remodeling, which led into room additions. And before I knew it, I had this, this general contracting company residential that I was like, holy cow, how did I get here? And, and I burned out. I woke up one morning, I looked at my wife and I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I just, it's, it, so we sold the company and I took a year off, you know? Oh, wow. Um, so it's so, interesting too. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, we talk, I talk a lot about mindset as well. Uh, and, uh, kind of like how people that, you know, when you're working full time for, uh, for the company, for a company, it's kind of easy. I mean, you work hard and everything, but it's kind of your life, your, your path is determined for you and you just kind of follow along. Um, but when you're, when you have your own business, when you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you have to make things happen. Things don't happen naturally. Right. You have to make things happen every day. And uh, like you did too, you have to look at, okay, well, I have, I'm, I'm in this cycle now where I lose all my employees in, uh, in November, October, November, and then I have to retrain a whole bunch of new people. So how do I adjust my company? How do I adjust my business so that I can be year round and all of that? And, um, and then the other thing too, is that kind of like how to do the, the work and life balance. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. So, you know, I took a year off and mm -hmm. didn't know what I was going to do. And I, um, uh, house hacked a couple of houses and this is long before house hacking was popular or sexy or the chic thing to do. Right. I can yep. remember my wife at the time screaming at me about the nails on the floor, you know, and, uh, but today it's like, you know, people, that's how people live, you know, and they house hack and they live in the house. And yeah. so, uh, along the way, I met a real estate agent though, who was extremely successful. And, and one thing, Eric, that I've always believed in is success leaves clues. And, you know, I heard Jim Rohn say years ago, success leaves clues. And if you want to be successful, go 
seek out successful people who are doing what you want to do and follow their model. So I met this guy named Todd and um, I went to him and I said, listen, I, I think I'd like to go in the real estate business. And he really encouraged me, he said, man, I think you'd be great at it, Mike. You've got great people skills and, and you know, know how to continually follow up. And um, so I said, great. I said, could I uh, come and shadow your team and see what you do? And and he said, no. <laughs> And I was a little taken back. <laughs> wow. by that. Yeah, that's surprising. Said, no, he said, no, I'm going to do one better for you. I'm going to make you a cassette tape. Now, Eric, I'm really dating myself because. Yeah, really. I don't, <laughs> I don't think we can find anything to make a cassette tape on today. But he, he did. He made me a cassette tape. And I listened to that over and over and over again. And those fundamentals I implemented into my real estate career. Yeah. And I went in the real estate business and my first nine months in the business, I sold 78 single family houses. Wow. Um, I was Remax Rookie of the Year that year. I went on wow. to build a, a real estate team uh, selling over 125 listings a year. I was a listing mm -hmm. agent. Um, and uh, from there, I did that for about uh, eight, seven or eight years uh, consecutively. Wow. 2005 rolled around and I saw the market starting to soften and was wondering what was going to happen. I wasn't really sure. I knew something in the market was going to happen. Um, you know, I'm not an economist, uh, but I, I could just, you know, you, you got that feeling that things were going to change. Mm -hmm. So I'd always wanted to be in the apartment business. And, and here again, success leaves clues, right? When I was in the construction business, I did a lot of work for a couple of large apartment syndicators from Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and I understood the model. So I understood you raised private equity, you married it with a great real estate deal. As long as everything went well, you stayed in the middle and everybody made money. Um, so I said, let me try this. So, you know, how I started to raise money is different than what you do today. I, I put a little ad in a newspaper and it said, looking for real estate investors. Wow. And my phone rang off the hook. Now, that was a very open-ended ad, right? I mean, it could have meant anything. Yeah. Um, but I raised $200,000 from that silly little newspaper ad. <laughs> um, and I closed my first syndication. It was an 11-unit deal. Um outside of Chicago. And I learned a lot of lessons really quick from that. But I went on to raise uh, $18 million. I bought $60 million worth of real estate. It was about uh, 4,000 apartments in five different states. I built a property management company managing uh, 7,500 units. Yeah. And um, um, grew way too fast. <laughs> Very, uh, I don't know if you want to unpack any of that or you want me to keep going. Yeah, so I think, no, I think this is great. I think this is, uh, it, it is very interesting. I mean, uh, the, uh, about the, the kind of like deciding again, kind of like your drive to go and look for, you know, what's the next thing? How do I, you know, what else should I be doing in any other opportunities out there? I mean, you, you can see that, yeah, you have this drive to always look for the next deal and then solving you know, drawing on your back experience, your resources and stuff like that, and then identifying the gap uh, and then finding finding that gap. And this is something that I talk about in my book as well is to kind of look at your resources, look at your time, your skills, your money and all of that, and then pick a strategy that kind of aligns with that. But also, if you pick a strategy, identify the gaps in resources and then fill fill that gap. Um, so that's is very important. And then the um, and then finding the investors very interesting because um, my my thing I I'm gonna put something up uh, next week about uh, you know for me like it doesn't matter how much money you have you're always short a couple of millions uh any project you want to do you just like you know you're always raising money it doesn't matter and it's very important to uh, to always be looking for investors and i'm surprised that the newspaper had worked but uh, that was uh, it's not that long ago <laughs> it was a fluke it was a fluke i don't think you could i don't think people read the newspaper anymore yeah i don't <laughs> so, um yeah so it was interesting so you know, there were, and, and here's the funny thing, right, is I think people always talk about the success piece, right? Nobody talks about the, the 
struggle yeah. along the way. I mean, listen, glamorous. I, I bought 4,000 apartments, $60 million worth of real estate. I raised $18 million in 30 mm. months. I mean, it was like yeah. that, right? Because I love doing what I'm doing. I'm passionate yeah. about it, you know? But you you mentioned it, you know, find what find your niche and work in your niche. And that's what yeah. I did, right? Yeah. Um, multi-family market rate rent B class product. I worked in that niche. I stayed in that niche. And there's a yeah. lot of distractions. There's a lot of shiny objects Absolutely. that we get involved with. Um, but yeah, and I, I totally agree. So I, yeah, and this is exactly like the the new investors. This is exactly kind of where they fall. They say, oh my, uh, you know, my uh, goal is to have passive income. And then they start doing flips and they start doing other things. It's like that's not passive income like you just you're again you're not aligned with your goal so the alignment needs to be this is my goal the strategy i'm going to get there and then look at the time and money that's uh, that's required and the skills that you need to uh, what are the resources available to you to to implement that strategy successfully and uh so this is very that's this is critical and kind of like be focused uh focused on that yeah for sure for sure See, the other thing too that I find interesting is that uh, in, you mentioned that in 2005, you were kind of like, you kind of noticed that something was wrong with the market. Uh, I was in California at the time. And what I noticed is just like complete exuberance <laughs> in terms of, of real estate and in terms of prices and in terms of projects and constructions and all of that. It, it seemed to be out of, um, out of whack or out of sync with uh, the, the reality or the perception that I had. Like I was seeing all these buildings being built and it's just like, okay, you're going to build all these office towers and then there's no place for the workers to, to live. Uh, the engineers, where are they going to live? And, uh, you know, all, there's some, some kind of out, things that were out of sync. What did so, you see in, in your market in 2005? Great question. Great question because it's, I think it's totally opposite today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in 2005, prices were getting really high. And I was like, this can't continue. Mm -hmm. And there was an overage of housing. So there was more housing than, than the prices. So we wondered what would happen with all of this existing house stock because there was so much new product coming on the market where today, there's not enough product. Yeah, the supply right? is low. Yeah. The supply is low. So the housing stock is low and the prices are high. So it's a total flip today than what it was. Mm -hmm. But but here, here's what I said to myself in 2005. I said, there's no way I'm going to sell 150 houses next year. It's not going to happen. And I'm glad that I made the choice because it didn't happen. And for some of my, my peers who were selling 150, 200 houses a year, they their business dropped out like that wow. so um i i made the right call in 2005 mm -hmm. you know listen i'll tell a quick story so i was with a guy one time we were going to his boat and there was there's a chain of lakes not far from where i live and we were going to his boat and we're driving through this town and i said hey fred you see this corner here i said be a great corner for a white hen white hen used to be a little convenience shopping store right like okay, okay. 7-eleven maybe you yeah, have, yeah, yeah. have in california yeah. mm -hmm. and uh he goes no way you're crazy you're out of your mind <laughs> two weeks later we're going to the boat and there's a <laughs> sign on that corner that says coming soon white hen I, <laughs> Fred, see, I told you so i, I kind of sometimes i have this vision eric of yeah. things that are going to happen not always but sometimes so the thing, what is important, I mean, I'm in the risk management business. That's kind of how, how I see things. And people tend to try to predict the one outcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that's the wrong way of doing it. And the, the way to do it is like, the, here's the, the, an array of outcomes that, uh, and I want to position myself to kind of like be, I want to position myself the best way that I can, knowing all the different outcomes and what is the, what are the most likely outcomes? There's some that are like very, very negative, but they're not going to happen. Some that are extremely positive, they're also not going to happen. 
So where are kind of like the, the bulk, where's the probability that uh, or, or the most likely scenarios or outcomes that are going to be? And then you position your portfolio, your investment, your effort to kind of like be uh, in the in the sweet spot of, uh, of these, uh, these different, different outcomes. So I wrote a book called Exit Plan, Your Complete mm -hmm. Guide to Multifamily Investing and Why You Need an Exit Plan Before You Buy. And I actually love to give your listeners a copy. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah, we'll put the link in the, in the show yeah. notes. So um, here's what I talk about in there is that I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaching and training and books and tapes and seminars and some great teachers, some great trainers. But everybody teaches you how to get in a deal, how to find a deal, how to operate a deal. Nobody teaches you how to get out yeah getting out doesn't always mean um getting out there's multiple exit plans and that's what you're talking about you have to have these multiple options right yeah so exiting might mean recapitalizing bringing a partner in doing an exchange doing something that you don't give up control or maybe it is giving up control but where do you maximize your profit and you need to know that before you ever even close on the deal or purchase it and and I'm I'm an advocate for that. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about. Yes, so that, absolutely. That's why I wanted to throw that in. Uh, yeah. You know, at this point. Yeah, it's, I, I love uh, opportunities where I have multiple exit strategies. That's why I like like the single family turnkey, or the single family rentals. I think it's it's great. You have many opportunities. Multifamily apartments. You also have uh, multiple kind of exit strategies that you can do. But you know, I can right now the, the single families they're they're rentals, but I can I can uh, renovate them differently and then turn them into uh, you know a retail a retail property for a owner occupied house. I can you know do like seller financing. I can do like package them. I can do all kinds of things. They do you know all kinds of different uh, exit plans that I can do for those. So uh, so I like that. And similar it's similar with the multifamily. Uh, business too like you have you have the opportunity to exit differently to kind of uh, refinance get most of your money out or all your money out and then continue to operate and get great cash flow um so yeah so i re really like that and commercial you also have if you're looking at it in a very long uh, um, investment horizon like 25 years you may end up also that hey we're gonna tear it down and build you know, uh, double the size of the, uh, of the building. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. When you can double, the foot, when you can double the footprint, you know, it makes, it makes more sense. And when you look at markets like, like Seattle, right. Where there's, where it's really hard to find an if infill project, mm -hmm. um, Manhattan, you know, those are markets that uh, are, are tough to find those infill projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the other thing too that I like about uh, about your story too, like you you mentioned earlier, a lot of people are talking about the success. Everybody wants to talk about success. Everybody wants to hear about success. But what I like about you is that you're very transparent, and you also talk about kind of like the things that really didn't go so well, and um, and we're gonna talk about the big ones in a few minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so. So, yeah, so in 2000, so that transition, these transitions are difficult. I mean, when you are all of a sudden you're a real estate uh, broker, you have a team of real estate agents working for you and doing so many deals. Now you say, OK, well, that's not going to happen this year. I can't commit to that because the market is soft softening. I'm going to kind of like pivot a little bit and go to multifamily try to find some investors and all of that. So this, this is a difficult transition for your team that's that's looking up to you, uh, the, the team that you're leading of, of real estate brokers, but also kind of, you know, head, getting into this new business. So how do you, like, what are some of the lessons learned there? Yeah, um, you mean in making the transition? Yeah, in making yeah, the think, transition. I, I think when you make a transition, you have to plan it. You know, you have to look at, at what the possibilities are and the possibilities of what can happen. Um, I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, we we run at things and we miss some of the details and red flags along the way. Um, you know, 
I, I, I always, I, I, I like this story. So I'm, I'm looking at a 350 unit apartment complex in Dallas mm -hmm. and it's a spring morning. And I want you to picture this. If you're driving, don't close your eyes. If you're not, maybe you could close your eyes, but so it's spring morning, the dew's coming off the swimming pool, the steam's coming off the swimming pool, the dew's sitting on the grass. You can hear the landscaper in the distance cutting the grass. You can smell the fresh cut grass. You uh, um, are you hear the buzzing of the uh, air blower blowing the sidewalks off, and um, I'm drinking my coffee, walking with this property manager, walking this property, and I'm falling in love, and I can't figure out if I'm falling in love with the property or the property <laughs> manager, <laughs> and, and I'm going, um, I gotta buy this thing, right? Um, and I, I didn't buy it, but it was a struggle because I went back and I fought with my analyst for six months about why we should buy this property and how good of a property I thought it was. And my analyst said, no, we're not buying it. And my analyst said, no, we're not buying it. <laughs> and, and we fought, I mean, we fought. And this woman was so good, Eric, she would lock us in a room for 45 minutes. And even if she wanted to buy a property, she'd tell us why we shouldn't. That's how good she was, <laughs> but she'd tell us how bad it was, but that we should buy it. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Um, and I'll never forget her. It's an she, art. Yeah. It's a, she, she's very talented. She was very talented. Um, anyhow, that property manager, we wound up hiring her as a district manager for, oh, nice. for a footprint we had in Dallas. But yeah, um, yeah so uh, there were a lot of things along the way that we kind of, um, you know, we, we don't pay attention to, right. Cause we have our own agenda uh, mm -hmm. in mind and, and we don't pay attention to them. And, you know, it's just like, it's like when I was growing my business, I grew way too fast. 2007, we brought on 2,700 units. It was about 17, uh, yeah, 17 transactions for 2,700 units. Wow. Um, didn't hardly have time to breathe, Eric. It was mm -hmm. one closing after another, one contract wow. after another. Um, and, you know, it, it caused some challenges. It, it yeah. made us very unstable. Yeah. And that was 2007. And we all know in 2008, mm -hmm. the world turned upside down. Um, and our company, it was because of our instability. Uh, we, it was like hitting a brick wall in a freight train at 200 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was undercapitalized, so I never raised enough money, and we Absolutely. were over leveraged. So picture this: I owned sixty million dollars worth of real estate at eighty-five uh, percent LTV, and and I don't know who was worse: the banks for giving me the money or me for taking it. <laughs> who should have been smarter, right? They were they were giving the money to anybody, well, um, not anybody, but. Uh... You know, but they were they were pretty lenient about getting money. Yeah. The, the criteria were pretty loose and all that. If you had a good people relationship, were, people were throwing money at yeah. me, just yeah. throwing money at me. So, um, uh, yeah, so I was over leveraged, undercapitalized, grew way too fast, very unstable. And as a result of that, I didn't pay attention to those red flags and details. Like, mm -hmm. You know, we bought some property we shouldn't have bought. Yeah. Um, I brought some investors in my company we shouldn't have brought in, um, you know, just just mistakes that we made over and over. And so it, you want me to finish telling? So yeah, this? no. So let's talk about those red flags because I think yeah. uh, you know. So what are some of the red flags that you saw? Uh, and and that was before the actual crisis hit, or is it like uh, just just after that? Well, so two thousand and eight. You know, I, I'm having lunch with my CFO and the news is on and they're carrying, you know, the employees are leaving Lehman Brothers by the dozens carrying yeah. boxes. Yeah. And I look at I look at across the table at my CFO and I go, we're screwed, aren't we? He goes, yeah, we're in big trouble. Oh, so you knew at that time. Wow. Well, you know, we, we had some kind of an indication, but uh -huh. here's what I thought. And here's really, you know, in in like I said, I'm not an economist, but I study as much as I can. Yeah. And in looking at it, I always thought, well, people are going to need a place to live. Yeah. yeah they're going to lose their house. They're going to get kicked out of their house because home ownership got pushed too high. Mm -hmm. Right. 
the country balances well at, at about 67% home ownership. You get beyond 67% home ownership and it starts to do this, okay? And wow. what happened was the administration took us into the 70s and we're at 72% home ownership, all kinds of money in the market. People are giving money away. It yeah. caused an instability in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So my business wasn't the only one that was affected. There were plenty no, of no. other businesses, yeah. right? So as a result of that, that instability, we came off the rails. Um, but I thought, well, people are going to need a place to live. So it's not going to affect the commercial yeah. market. Yeah, it might affect retail and it might affect the office space because people are going to le lose their jobs and they're going to lose their houses and the foreclosure rate's going to go high. Mm -hmm. But I never thought that people would, would uh, people were going to need a place to live. Yeah. Here's where it made a lot of sense to me. It's like the first quarter of 2009, I get a phone call from a property manager on a property we own in Indiana. And, and she says to me, she, she's in tears. And I'm like, Tiffany, what's wrong? She says, I've got 32 moving trucks in the parking lot this morning. It's a Monday morning. She goes, I don't have a scheduled move out for 45 days. Wow. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I, I, so we go down there and people moved out of apartments in droves. Now, here's what happened, right? We were in markets that were pretty heavily capitalized in the car industry, in the uh -huh, transportation yeah. mm -hmm. industry. And in 2008, those were the two worst industries uh, after the housing market yeah. to, to get clobbered, right? Mm -hmm. So when you take, you know, this particular property happened to be in a town that 30% of the businesses were manufacturing companies that manufactured parts for cars. Yeah knobs for radios, dashboards, seat liners, seat springs, those types of parts. And um, they went out of business. They just, and, and that caused, you know, those types of things happened a lot. That was all in the Ohio Valley, right? Mm -hmm. So um, our better operating properties were in the South. So anything yeah. we owned in Dallas or, or Alabama op tended to operate a little bit better. Um, but it was yeah. that Ohio Valley stuff that got hurt pretty bad. So it, it sounds, so there's a couple of, so obviously 2008 is, is happening at you. And as you mentioned, like you were growing very, very fast, uh, incredibly fast. And then there is, uh, so you saw, you saw some red flags. Uh, so, so what are some, so some of the red flags, I guess, before 2008, yeah, because if you're thinking that something is going to happen then you kind of want to be in a strong position. Uh, and that's probably what you felt. You were not quite in a strong position. You had all kinds of things. But what were some of the red flags? And then I'd like you to answer also, what, how do I know I'm growing too fast versus uh, just at the right speed? Yeah, uh, great questions, <laughs> right? So I think some of the red flags are, number one, pricing just continuing to go. You know, I mean, you look at cap rates right now, and I heard somebody say that how much more can cap rates compress? Well, there's still three more points that they can compress. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. So, yeah. Talk to you in six months. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I had a, I had a guy on my podcast one day, um, you know, big capital markets firm out of L.A., and he goes, look, Germany's been at, at sub three for 12 years. He goes, we're headed there. Wow. So, yeah. you know, I. I I underwrote a deal recently that was probably a three and a quarter cap. And I thought, no way, I'm not even going to, I don't even want to do it. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, prices, prices got so high. Right. Yep. And I'm talking about the residential market back then, not even the yep. commercial market where prices got so high, you know, and look at it today. Okay. So I don't understand it. I, I honestly don't understand it, but Eric, yeah. if a house is worth a hundred thousand and you go in and you're willing to pay 112 and then you're willing to insure the gap. So, you know, the house isn't going to appraise it uh, at 112. It's only going to appraise at a hundred, but you tell the owner, I'll come up with the extra 12 in case it doesn't appraise. 
Now you paid a hundred and a quarter for that house. Mm -hmm. it, where's the value? It's yeah, just yeah. like in 2005 when banks were saying, hey, we're going to give you 125% on the property. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to say the property's worth a hundred, but we'll value it at 125. And then we're going to give you two loans. We're going to give you an 80% loan and a 20% loan. So you don't have to pay any PMI. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I tell me what sense any of that conversation makes. We're, <laughs> and people do it. People are yeah, doing really. it all day long every day. Wow. So um so it, a red flag, yeah, that's a red flag. Yeah. Looking back, it's a big red yeah. flag. But what about your business? Like what are some did you see any red flags in your business that there was some things organizationally or uh again the, the speed at which you were ac acquiring you know, any red flags or any kind of things that you saw in your business yeah, so, that you should have addressed? So um, when I was growing really fast, we didn't have enough time to stabilize properties behind us. So I'd close 100 units and then next week I'd close 100 more. Nobody, my team dropped the ball as far as stabilizing those units behind us. Uh -huh. Um, you know, where was the construction work going on? Where were the, where was, you know, the business plan being executed? Poor execution is the detriment of any business. Mm -hmm. We can have a great plan, a great paper on plan, but unless we execute properly, it's, it's worthless paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I, and I saw it going on here, you know, here, here's an example. So 2008, um, I'm closing a deal in Cincinnati and um, I, I'm sitting in a closing office waiting for the, for funding from my office to come through. It's not coming through. It's not coming through. It's 10 to 5. I finally get my partner on the phone and he says, I don't know how to tell you this. Well, when your partner tells you, when you're looking for $500,000 and your partner says, I don't know how to tell you this. Nothing good happens after somebody says that. <laughs> right. Nothing good happened after that. Um, he said that I, I had to move money from the escrow account and put it in a in in the operating account. I thought I'd have the money back by now. Oh. I said, I told you when we went into business that you never did things like that. He said, well, you know, he goes, I know. So I wound up dry closing that where we just signed all the paperwork. I, that was a Wednesday. I said, I'll have it funded by Tuesday. Um, to complete the transaction. Yeah. I went home, I finished raising the money, I gave some more equity away, I had to raise some more money on the deal, but I was able to, to get it closed but within the week. Yeah. But here's what happened. I never told my wife about my business. Uh, once in a while, I'd say, hey, you know, we just closed another deal or bought another par apartment. But I never told her about the day to day stuff or the things that went on. Uh -huh. So she didn't have any idea what just happened on Wednesday afternoon. Um, on Friday that week, we went to dinner with my partner and his wife and me and her. And on the way home, she says, I don't trust him. I said, oh, honey, don't worry about it. Thinking I'm a good husband. I got this under control. You're safe. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And I didn't have anything under control, but I didn't know it. Um, on Wednesday, the following week, well, here's what I should have said to my wife. Tell me more about that. What uh, don't yeah. you see? What, what? Yeah. What am I missing that you're seeing? So I'm not paying attention to details right now, right? I'm blowing uh -huh. them off. Yeah. And I did, I did this often. And then a week later, I'm out to lunch with my attorney. And my attorney said, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what he's up to, but I don't like it. And you oh. need to pay attention. I said, oh, Bob, don't worry about it. I got this. And I didn't. But see, I had two people come to me within a very short period of time, say, your partner's up to something. I don't trust them. Pay attention wow. to what's going on. And I said, yeah. I got this. So we take people. Now, he and I were friends for 25 years. And I don't, you know, listen, I broke the law um, in, in, in this. So, um, but I just want to say I didn't pay attention to yeah. the details around me, those things around me that I should have paid attention to. Uh -huh. Wow, this is uh, interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, people are critical, like they're very, very important, obviously, and character is very important. I think you spend a lot of time now with 
my core intention is to really uh, talk about ethics and talk about you know yeah doing things ethically what's right what's right yeah. and wrong i think we kind of forget we kind of forget about that and uh i mean you look on instagram you look on all of that and you just you see all these fake fake gurus scammers all, all these people that are just trying to uh get your wallet or what's in your wallet uh, you know or I, I don't know like it, there's so many scams going on it's just incredible so yeah, trusting the character, trusting the other what other people are saying, what do you think, and all of that. So it's, right. I think it's very important. So here's the other thing: I would I would walk, you know, we'd have an office meeting, and and I wouldn't get reports, right? I, I'd want to see financials. We have to in our business, we have to look at those KPIs. You mm -hmm. know, if you yeah. if you're operating a deal as a syndicator and you have a third party management company you darn well better know what your metrics are and yeah. you better know what your metrics are that you want to look at. Yeah. So what's my income? What's my expenses? Are my expenses out of line in any, any way higher this month than they were last month or quarter to quarter? Mm -hmm. What's my occupancy? How many applications have we taken? You know, what's my waiting list look like? What's my, uh, you know, what's my move outs over the next 90 days? What do I have in line? You know, do I have any evictions in process? You better know what your KPIs are, okay? And yep. and I couldn't get reports. I had thirty eight companies, and I couldn't get I couldn't get detailed reports on half of them. Mm -hmm. um, so so there was stuff going on that, you know, I I was the face of the company. I was the builder. I was the you know the guy who went out and built relationships uh, with investors and and property owners and bought property. And, and I thought, I thought my partner and the rest of the company had my back. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't really what happened. I would ask my partner, how's things going? No problems at all. We're doing mm -hmm. great. How's mm -hmm. cash flow? No problem at all. So, um, yeah, is, was the culture a culture of, oh, we don't want to tell anybody, like, if something goes wrong, let's not talk about it. Let's just talk about the uh, the things that go well kind of things or? Yeah, the culture was between my partner and the director of finance to uh, handle things between themselves. Oh. Really. Um, and they didn't... Uh, very rarely came up in a business meeting in a in a weekly uh team meeting um that they're you know um so yeah yeah so i think yeah exactly so i think that sometimes you know i did work in companies uh where yeah it was the culture was like that i mean you don't want to you, you don't want to upset because your 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 boss or your the manager or the vp was so uh reactive and aggressive that you say okay well i'm not gonna say anything uh or you have the uh or just or just you just handle compliance if you, you get beaten with a stick whenever you do something then okay i won't do that again yeah, but right. <laughs> in the long run it's not very good so um you know so yeah so I, I worked with a couple of companies like that that were um you know, the, just the culture was not open. It was not an open communication culture. And then if there was any problems, they were kind of buried. And right. then you wouldn't, eventually they're going to surface one way or another. And, um, and then it was, you know, cover your, cover your assets, um, you know, for the, um, to make sure that you are not, you know, fired or removed from the project or something like that. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, so here's, you know, here's kind of what happened, right? So, yeah. you know, from that incident in 2008, um, you know, things started to unravel because, you know, the markets went upside down, the world went upside down. You got all the bad paper on Wall Street, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, AIG, mm -hmm. um, all these all these major companies, hundreds of year old companies that are no longer in existence. What do you think is going to happen in the marketplace? What do you think is going to happen in the world? Well, the world went upside down. Um, so as a result of that, I had I had 38 companies. Those 38 companies, uh, some of them started to go to foreclosure. 
And what I should have done was just let those deals go to foreclosure and let, you know, a couple dozen investors get hurt. But I'm the kind of guy that I don't want anybody to get hurt. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. So I, you know, decide to start moving money back and forth between companies. Remember, I said I had really strong companies in the South and in the Ohio Valley, they were a little weaker. Well, I started to move money back and forth between between companies and each company had different partnership. Is that right? Is that correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, now I was told by my accountant and attorney that it was okay to do that as long as I left a paper trail and put the money back when it was uh, when the markets came back. So um, I had seen recessions in the past, been involved in recessions in the past. I thought 17, 18 months, yeah. it'll be a 10, 12 percent correction. Uh -uh. Seven or eight years it lasted, 40 percent correction in the marketplace. People are still affected today by it. And we were we got killed by it. So I'm moving money back and forth and I didn't disclose it to my investors. So because I didn't disclose it to my investors, I wound up being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges and ultimately sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Um, so let's, let's talk about the, the structure of that. Uh, so basically you, you own an apartment building, let's say in Indiana, you create an LLC to basically own that. So that's one of the companies that you would have, you right. have, and then you would have partners on that. Um, if it was a syndication, you have a number of partners and then, you know, so this is supposed to be one entity and it's supposed to have its own accounting, its own things and then right. you have another apartment building in uh cincinnati again, again another llc another set of investors and all of that and you're managing all of those as separate uh entities there's some communications that need to happen with the partners whenever things go well and things don't go so well uh, financially and then but yeah crossing like i've never heard that about crossing uh, funds but uh sometimes you have yeah so not normally it's, it's but you didn't want to go back to the investors and say hey you know we're having a wrong we had some struggles with the cash flow we had 30 move outs for that for that building that we didn't expect uh and um so we're not going to be able to pay the mortgage so well, here's, everybody here's, needs to write get their checks up checkbooks up here's the deal there's typically in the PPM, there's a provision that for a cash call. Well, yeah. the markets were so robust in 2005 and six. And remember I said, I didn't think that the commercial market would get hit. Yeah. I told my attorney, I said, let's pull that provision out of the PPM. Oh, okay. because I think it'll be a great opportunity for investors and we can use it as a sales tool to bring more investors in yeah so because investors thought wow i don't ever have to worry about a cash call yeah i can do this deal mm -hmm. so i shot myself in the foot again one of those red flags that i didn't pay attention to right mm -hmm. um thinking that i was going to um be this you know have this great sales thing never thinking that the market was going to do what it did on the commercials yeah. and it did so I it, it, so I, I pulled the provision out. So because of that, because I didn't like to tell anybody bad news, because yeah. I didn't want to go back to the investors and say, hey, listen, these markets suck and we're in big trouble. Yeah, um, I wanted to be the hero. And I yeah. thought, you know, it's just a few months. This will pass and we'll put this money back. The, the, the markets are going to correct. Well, they mm -hmm. didn't correct Derek. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, so. What about on the financing side? Was there any uh, anything on the financing side that could have helped, like talking to your your bank or uh, so the bank did terms, a lot of the terms wrong? Pardon? Yeah, the banks did a lot of resets. Yeah. So they, we I did I did a few workouts where mm -hmm. we actually got principal reductions, we got interest rate reductions. I was paying seven and eight percent interest rates back then. I was getting reductions down to 3% interest. Yeah. Um, the banks were just saying, hey, listen, we're going to knock four points off of this for you. Here's what your new payment is. 
um, and you can go six months with no payments. So now they're taking it and putting it on the back. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I had this cash flow in some of these properties, which we were taking and putting over here, right? Yeah. Instead For some of them of, that you were not able to get the workouts, right? Right, right. Yeah. I should have left the reserves build up and I yeah. didn't. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, I made, I made 10, 15 mistakes that I know of today that I won't make today when I syndicate a deal today. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that because I think this this is very important. And because, you know, there are a lot of investors out there that this is kind of like what they do. They kind of like do a JV with, uh, with this person on this house and then they do another JV. They're just getting started, just a small house flip. Right. And then they put, they get the money and all of that. And then they get some money from somewhere else. And then it's all in the same account, maybe even that can be <laughs> even worse, but some of them, they have different bank accounts, but they don't, it's, it doesn't seem that bad. Like it doesn't seem like, Oh yeah, I just need this $5,000 from here and move it, move it there for just a couple of weeks. Then when I get this money, then I can move it back and then I'm going to record it. And, uh, it does, you know, it doesn't really seem that bad, uh, but yeah, I mean, so, so thank you for sharing that because I think this is something that people need to be aware of yes. uh, because you can really get in trouble with, uh, not, I'm not even thinking about the law, I'm thinking about, about your partners, about your, your business. And, yeah. uh, you know, if things go well, then you're fine. But if things go don't go so well, then you just kind of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it just yeah. gets worse very quickly. It accelerates the you know the 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 descent yeah and you just said it you know as long as everything goes okay everything's yeah. fine it's as soon as things go sideways that now it's not fine anymore yeah yeah and it, it, it makes it that much worse like it multiplies the the complexity and the problems and stuff right. like that so sure. Sure. so thank you for sharing that this um you know again like we, we discussed earlier uh people keep talking about the good good stories and all of that and they kind of leave behind some of the, the the hardship that they had to go through and the less the hard lessons that they that they learned and they're not sharing with other people and other people are making mistakes so i really appreciate you spending the time uh, of, of course, people should go on your website, mycoreintentions.com, uh, and you have a lot of information there. You talk about, uh, you know, you're a public speaker, you're an author, uh, and you talk about your story. You want to share that, that story with other investors um, so that they don't make the same mistakes. And I really, uh, really appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. Uh, as anything else that you want to mention before we we wrap up anything important that we missed yeah you know just real quick and i'll ju just take a couple minutes here but yep um, you know I, I did get charged with wire fraud and mail fraud charges got sentenced to 10 years in federal prison i went to prison for about eight years um while i was gone i was faced with a decision that i could either die on the vine in prison or i could re-engineer myself and i chose to re-engineer myself I went to college. I got a bachelor's degree. Um, I, I wrote two books. I wrote two home study courses. I wrote an ethics course. I taught real estate investing, property management, and ethics for six years in prison. I was on an outreach program, went in the community. I told my story to small business owners and local college students. I met a professor from the University of Minnesota. He and I co-authored a paper that we had published this year in the Business mm -hmm. Journal of Ethics. Yeah. Uh, it gets um, it, it it gets taught at the collegiate level for forensic accounting and sales and marketing classes. Um, today today I want people to understand how easy it is to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, that even though I had great success and lost everything, um, that there's restoration. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm a resilient guy. I'll bounce back. Um, and and my goal today is to help other people not make those mistakes to build a successful business, uh, to scale it properly, but to do it and to pay attention and to do it correctly. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I can, I love to network and, and talk to people. So if anybody ever wants to reach out, you know, I'm available. So, um, so where can people reach, reach out to you? Oh, sure. It's uh, Mike at my core Mm -hmm. uh, or anywhere you hang out on uh, social media. So whether that's Instagram or LinkedIn, 
um, my two favorite places, but then there's Twitter and Facebook and, mm -hmm. you know, my marketing. So what's, your, what's your user na name on, the uh, on Instagram? It's, um, uh, an, an Insta. Oh, Mike Morowski. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So your name. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I, I looked at your article in uh, that, that that you co-authored uh, on the Journal of Business Ethics. I think this is. Uh, I'll also put that on the link uh, in the show notes. I think this is very interesting, and you go into the details about kind of like what what happened, and uh, you know some of the conversations with uh, with the lawyer just before you go into a board meeting, and uh, say. <laughs> Yeah, it's just just incredible. I'll leave it at that. But uh, you, people should read it and see how easy it is to kind of like get in the, on the wrong side of uh, on the wrong side of a transaction, or I would I wouldn't say the law, but it's kind of the wrong side of ethics. I would say, but uh, it doesn't wrong feel side of that bad. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's just it doesn't feel. Yeah, it's it's a very shady gray area. It's not yeah. black and white. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. So thank you for sharing, Mike. Uh, you also mentioned your book. So what's what's the title of the, your book and how can people get it? Yeah, sure. So I published uh, one of my books last year. Uh, it's called Exit Plan, Your Complete mm -hmm. Guide to Multifamily Investing and Why You Need an Exit Plan Before You Buy. Um, I, uh, you know, like I said, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaching and training and books and tapes over the years from some great authors, some great trainers. Everybody teaches you how to get in a deal. Nobody teaches you how to get out or how to yeah. maximize your profit. Mm -hmm. And that was my goal was to teach people when, where, and how to maximize your profit. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, we calculate our profit up front. You know, when we buy right. the property, before we buy the property, we know how much we can expect in terms of profit, depending on the different strategies and all of that. And I have the same kind of uh, issue with uh, 401ks. You know, people are saving, saving, saving. And then, okay, well, how are you going to get that out? How is that going to give you passive income, a stream of income at retirement? You tell me. Nobody, Nobody's thinking about that. And uh, so I spent a lot of time talking about that. So, Mike, well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your conversation, your transparency. Uh, so it is a, an amazing story. And thank you for sharing. You bet, Eric. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for listening to Break Away from the Rat Race with your host, Eric Martell. If you want to share your story and experience with our listeners, please message us on Facebook at Break Away from the Rat Race. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast on iTunes.